I think I got all the pitches in, man. <laughs> yeah, great, man. <laughs> It's Maybe. crispy sometimes, and it's also big sometimes. Yeah. I'd have them tune it way down when I wanted the big fat sign sound, and I'd let it be crispy when I didn't want, when I, you know, when I wanted more of a less bottomy sound. So that was the key. It was the tuning when I wanted that sound. And um, Dave Weckl loves that sound, by the way. He always tells me that, man. How did you get that? I said, yeah. I had a Tune the snare drown down. I did it with all drummers, but but Steve's was the best sounding, and at that low end stuff. Yeah. No, and Jeff Beccaro, I didn't make him do it too much because it's not in his style of playing. It didn't sound really good low. I just, but Jeff Jeff snare's great too. <laughs> yes, it was. It was one of his sets, and um. By the way, I'm going to start a YouTube educational channel in about two months. And what I'm going to, uh, one of the major things I'm going to do, not only uh, other than the guitar stuff, I'm going to teach how to technically record. Yeah. A lot of people do not understand about phase and physics. And there, it, it's this is going to be a great learning experience for everyone. I figured this out years ago and all this stuff and you're gonna love it man i've known all this information even before you could see the wave and pro tools i figured it out it's all about physics and air movement for me uh, the anthem is of course uh, roof garden because uh, that became the hit in in our country in holland of course with the very special moments that that there was some space for mr get to to play some licks and that really made a little bit also that song absolutely how was the experience of you of recording that song roof garden it was a ball man it was always fun you know i love working with steve you know i talked to him a few months ago and i'm going to give him a call again soon we're old pals man before i played with him on record dates before i started producing so i already knew steve and i don't think anybody has got better time than him now we didn't record that stuff back in the day with a click rarely did did i use a click sometimes it's on roof but garden a click or not i don't remember it's you can find out uh, just start at the beginning and then jump real quick yeah. near and see if the tempo is bumped up or but in his feel, man, was just incredible. Man. Yeah. It's incredible. He's he's so smooth, man, and everything's just so like polite and 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 grooves, man. And he's the king of simplicity too. Yeah, he doesn't overplay, man. Ever. I don't remember what I told him, but I said, "Look, guys, this is kind of a funk tune. It's it's going to have a taste of funk to it. You know, always Abraham Laboreal on bass. Yeah. most of the." Or Hungate or Mike Picaro. I said, no, it's a funk groove, man. Let's just think of it as a funk groove, you know, tilted a little bit. And George Duke on piano was perfect, man. He came up with great little Phil chordal licks, you know. That I I played a muted guitar part in that song yeah. probably. That track felt great, man. It 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 feels great. <laughs> My name is Jake or Jake the Rake or Rake. Most of my friends call me Rake. And long story how the name came. But um, anyway, so when I was getting a drum sound with Steve on one of the sessions, I said, Steve, man, it's time to replace the snare head. It's beat up. It's not vibrating equally. Uh, should always every drum like Tom and snare, you know, when you tune your drums, you're hitting uh, right around each lug and then you tune it to get rid of any beating. 
because if the pitch is the same all the way through, it will ring. It'll it'll you know dwell longer. If you have one of the, uh, the tuning pegs too loose or too tight, and it's screwing with the pitch, phase cancellation comes into play. It'll just stop ringing because it doesn't have the vibration continually moving the head you know that right so i said steve man you got to replace the head it's too dead it it there's no life to it it's not evenly tuned and even though we have it padded down it's just not sounding like it should so the head's too shot it's got too many dents in it to, to ring properly so he changed the head and after he changed the head he gave me the old head can you see what it says yeah yo rake I sounded good out there. <laughs> it sounded good out here. Out here, yeah. Uh, you, you gotta love that, right? Yeah, man. So I stuck it in a frame because I thought it was hilarious. Yeah, man, I'm glad I did. I gotta send Steve a picture of this. He'll crack up. Oh, man. You can, you can see how shot the head is, right? It's gotta be broken in. We know, we yeah. know it. The, of course you have to break it in. What's the date on this? Now I have four, uh, five April 82. So there you go. After we Steve replaced the head, you know, I said, man, I know this is a drag, but prep, you know, keep pushing on it for about 15 minutes. Let's get this thing as even as we can, whack it a bunch, you know, get it used to be in the, in the shape it needs to be in so it'll remain the same when we start recording, you know. Yeah. And, I mean, you've changed heads a million times, you know. So that's what we did. And man, the difference was big. The, the, yeah. new, head, the new head made a difference. Oh, I got a story for you. <laughs> we were getting a drum sound. Maybe it was the first time I worked with him in my studio when I hired him. And... Um, I brought him in New York, you know, because he was living back there. And um, it costs a lot more bread, but I didn't mind. I wanted him on a, on a bunch of stuff. So I said, okay, Steve, um, let me get to set the levels and EQ the drums, right? So we we'll work on the snare for a bit, and I get the snare, you know, EQ the way I want, and then the kick, you know, then the toms. And he was only playing in about half, well, maybe a... a a third of what a fill could end up being volume wise so we do the first take of a tune a rundown we do the first rundown and he plays a fill man you know one of those duck -a -bomb things you know and the meters were just pinned i said steve when we're doing the wax for me to set the levels you got to hit it go from medium soft medium and hard so I said, everybody take a break. I got to work with Steve for about a half an hour here. Yeah. It's because he has uh, such amazing dynamically range. It can, big, big, so big, big range. That's and another I, thing that makes him great, man. You know. And he plays, I think, very soft in the studio. He really makes it sound big by playing soft. Do you know why? Good thing you brought this up because this is part of physics and my thinking. When you play a drum lightly, you're going to get more finesse out of the sound. It's going to be a bigger sound, not lightly, but medium, you know, not hitting it too hard. Because when you hit a drum real hard, the transient goes through the roof, yeah. you get this big spike on it, but it loses the warmth and the depth because of that. So the way he typically hits the snare is not that hard and it's just a bigger sound because you're not fighting the physics of a giant spike coming up at attack because that destroys the bottom end. You know, when you hit it medium or soft to medium, there's there's more meat to the sound and makes it bigger. Yeah. That's that's why on the Manhattan Transfer stuff, when I had him tune it way down, that's why it sounds so big, man, because he's not hitting it too hard. I played a lot of record dates with him. Um, he ended up with the Lawrence Welk Band gig. <laughs> yeah. Hey, a steady gig. 
got to hand it. Plays amazingly also on the record. First of all, it's always that on this record it was all Steve Gadd. You make every drum sound like the drums of Steve Gadd. It's almost the same sound. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph and I grew up. Um, when I was 18, I was in the Don Ellis band. Have you ever heard of that band? Yeah, with old time signatures. I, kind of thing. Right. I was in the band, and so was Ralph. Oh, and yeah. Ralph, Ralph is an excellent drummer, man. And um, I started, you know, telling him, man, you got to get into the pop thing and the R&B thing. It's, it, it'll be good for you. And he made the transition. You know, he's a good jazz player, great yeah. jazz But he made the transition well. Yeah, so I used Ralph on some stuff. And then it was became mostly Jeff and Gad or Mike Baird. Yeah. Mike Baird on the rock stuff. Mike's got really good time. He's another guy that could play with a click real well. And he gets that big, fat sounding drums, typically. That kind of a sound. It's kind of like what I call the weed sound a lot of the rock guys you know marijuana right a lot of the rock guys they all have these real big sounding toms and you know um so mike was more along those lines uh not too big but that was his kind of sound but you know it worked fine i just brightened things up but if it got too dark and too too boomy ish you know when rock stuff mostly for mike or dance stuff if it was disco stuff or or rock he would be the guy you know okay. yeah on the airplay album he played on some tunes uh when we didn't couldn't get chef and uh, you know plus i work with mike a lot in the studio yeah. good cat funny guy <laughs> When I walk in, I see Ed Green's playing drums. I know how the 16th tilt's going to be. Wow. He slightly tilts the 16th when it's a 16, it's supposed to be kind of 16th straight. He still slightly tilts it. And since I'm playing rhythm guitar, I go with his tilt. Yeah. So I, when I walk in the studio and I see who's playing drums, I go, okay, if it's James Gadson, I know where his tilt is. Uh, Harvey Mason, I know where his tilt is. So for every different drummer, as soon as I look at him, I go, okay. I know where this is going to be, but and that's where, from, where, where's the tilt of Mr. James Gadsden? He would he nice. It was a good tilt, a good R and B funk tilt. Nice, sweet. Yeah, it, it, an underrated cat, man. And he, it's one of my favorites. Uh, uh, it's Steve right. Gadsden, and then it's James Gadsden. Gadsden's just in uh, just grooves, man. Yeah. He had this, he'd get this shit-eating grin smile on his face when it was feeling real good. And I told him about two months ago, I emailed him, and I said, James, when you got that grin on your face, man, I knew we were all in the pocket you wanted us to be in. Yeah. Just get that look, man. Great player. Great player. Ed Green, too, man. Yeah, and that's that is such an unknown cat, but he plays on. Nobody knows Ed Green almost, and that I I want to interview him also because for me, always when I hear a record and I say well, who's the drummer, I Ed Green, man, you know, and he's not such a well known guy. Uh, he is around here. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but he he did so much amazing stuff. People really have to check him out. Ed Green, man, he has a backbeat from heaven, I think. Barry White records, all of them. That's yeah. the a lot of Motown records. Yeah, uh, let's and see. also the the Fagan things, the the, oh, the AJ yeah. things. You gotta love this. He only played on one tune, right? I've got the news, right? Yeah. I think that was the only tune he played on in yeah. Asia, right? One, yeah, and and the Nightfly he plays on, but that's the solo record of Donald Fagan. Well, that's the that's my favorite, to tell you the truth. Yeah, <laughs> what song did he play on Nightfly? I don't know exactly, but he, I know for sure it's James Getson, Jeff Porcaro, and Ed Green on the night flight. Okay. The tune that I love the way uh, Ed played is, is I've Got the News. Because yeah. he always played Bach, Bach, Adum, or Bach, Adum. That was a standard fill. He'd never get in the way, man. When you're on a record date, you play what's needed, you know? And that was a common fill. Uh, David Page <laughs> counted them up one time, and there was like 55 variations of that. But that's what made that record so special, you know? 
the pocket him, pock pocket him, you know, and dig his swing groove on that. That's a he's he's that's a that's a, a, a definitely a t- major tilt. I mean, it's it you know it's almost a triplet thing. Okay. Ed was a jazzer, at least that I know of. Okay, you know what? I'm going to call him and ask him. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think he was a jazzer. I, he could play anything, but I don't think that was a scene, man. I never heard him play jazz actually. Well, and if you talk to him, say that the guy from Holland really wants to give him a spotlight and wants to interview him because he he des- deserves for me a very big spotlight. I think that that are that unknown yeah. studio cats, you know. You can find a man. Go online. He's got to have yeah, Facebook. But- By the way, here's a, here's something that you're going to want to know. All right, we know a lot of people put real drums on records after they've recorded everything else. Yeah, absolutely the wrong way to do it absolutely the wrong way to do it i've tried it and i've hated it and i've never used it ever here's what you do you record well a drum machine groove and maybe not even tilt the hat maybe you just play eighth notes on the hat instead of playing a 16th pattern unless you want to play a shuffle or a, a triplet groove whatever okay Just put some rough instruments down. They don't even have to be the final. Let the drummer hear the music that's going to happen, just the basic music. You don't have to worry about getting it tight. And you just give the drummer the click. Let him play with the the click and barely let him hear the music, just enough to give him the idea of the tune. Write a chart out where you want fills, whatever, okay? After you get the drum track, now start over. That's what to do. It's never going to feel right putting the drums on at the end unless you quantize them. Because if you play with a drum machine, everybody's already tilting away from the drum machine a little bit to get a little bit of feel in it. So now when you're adding the drums last, unless the guy's quantized, it's a, not right. It's a mess. It just doesn't work for me. <laughs> It was either myself or Greg Matheson that named that groove. We called it a funk a shuffle. Yeah, man. Funk a shuffle. As a matter of fact, it says it right here on the part. <laughs> right. And there's some drum drum things I wrote for him to catch. This is uh this tune was definitely written out. I don't think he played this one fill I wrote out, but it didn't matter. Jeff was great, man. And he could read because of his dad, so that helped. Yeah, he he was not good with a click. It was it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it. I just let him I'd rather he just play. I don't care if a song speeds up a little. Yeah. You know, I if the chorus speeds up a little and i don't care if the verse lays back a little bit as long as it's not radical and feels good and as long as everybody's coming in on one when they're supposed to you know so we knew jeff's groove so well that on record dates i knew where one was coming you know um every all the time because i i knew his feel You get used to the feel and you get used to their groove on the hat for different different styles of music. <music> Playing with a click, first of all, here's something else I should say. The only guy that should be listening to the click on a tracking date is the drummer. Yeah. The only time the okay, so he should have a separate mix. The other guy should only hear the click during the count off or in between a a spot where the drums are out. So there should be two separate click feeds and one designed for the the band that would only be hearing it when when there's no drums. But other than that, it should just be the drummer listening to the click because when we listen to the click and the drums, who do you go with, the click or the drummer? Yeah. Sometimes the drummer will be early. Sometimes he'll be late, typically early. So who am I playing with? I've got to tune the click out and go with the drummer. And it's just an extra thought process I don't want. So, you know, the yeah. click, to me, that's the way I would do it. If I ever record tracks again and it's with a click, only the drummer's going to hear it and the band will only hear it when there's in sections with no drums. No, oh, okay. I forgot to mention John Robinson. He's another guy with a, that's great with a click. Jr. is a great drummer. Yeah. Great drummer. So, 
you got Vinny, who's like, Dean Parks told me he's the best of the best with a click now. I mean, it really cancels out. You don't even hear it. So, um, but back in the day, Mike Baird was very good. <clears throat> I can't remember if I ever used a click with, with Gad. But he would be good. He would be good. His time's so even, it would be good. I don't think Keltner would have been good with a click. Keltner floats. But who knows? Maybe he is. Um, yeah, man. <laughs> On this album, that's a question I always want to ask you on the High Crime album. I see a lot of dr drummers in the in the credits, but they have very strange names. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. That was a joke. It was so funny, and I always wondering, I, I really searched on the internet, who are these guys, you know? They're me. R R R Rug Toupee. <laughs> Rug Toupee? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a um, a nickname for a friend of mine, Slug, uh, and Mr. Mister, who's Steve George. Yeah. Now, right. did, I, was, did I use him as a drummer's name or did I use him as a keyboard player's name? I don't know. I, don't, I think it's a drummer's name, but... I, I liked it so much, I used it. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's all, it's drum machine, man. Yeah, that that's you know what? I don't remember. It, it was either the uh, Oberheim DMX uh, or whatever the drum machine was called. It's either the Lindrum that came out after the 9000. Okay. Or it could have been the 9000. I, I can't remember. It sounds really remember. like a 9000. But... But I didn't use the snare and the kick on the 9000. I used roger nichols who was steely dan's engineer yeah. he invented a sample box it was one of the first ones and it was called wendell jr he had a, another setup on his computer and um he had two samples that he he sampled from steely dan um a snare drum called the heart snare and the heart kick and i would plug those into the output of the 9000 and it would immediately trigger it there's a slight going to be a slight delay but you know in the land of midi there's all kinds of delay anyway yeah. um if the, the, that snare is a great snare and i actually I'm afraid to plug in the Wendell Juniors. They're, they won't work. They'll blow up if they if I power them up. They'll blow up. So I'm gonna have a friend of mine fix them and yeah. they are really good sounding drums. I've always been into electronics ever since I was a kid. I used to engineer my father's radio show when I was 11 years old on the weekend at six in the morning. And I'd run the four turntables and the two tape machines that had the jingles on it for commercials. And I'd read all this off a log and my dad would stack up the records he wanted me to play and what in the order. And I was in heaven, man. And the console was not confusing to me. I understand point A goes to point B to C to D to E. I understand no problem ever since I first looked at one. I figured it out. So um, I've always been into electronics and engineering. So why not do the job myself, you know? Yeah, but it's, know really, it's really, now nowadays, it's really common. Everybody has their computer at home and can uh, do all the stuff by himself, unfortunately. <laughs> Except... They don't know what they're doing a lot of times. No. <laughs> That's why I'm doing the YouTube channel. Yes. To teach everyone what I've learned, yeah. what I've figured out and learned. That will and be very helpful. It will be very helpful, man. You're going to love it. I'm telling you. I can walk into my studio at any time and just look at gear and think about a concept and gods are good i'll come up with something i've never thought about before a different way to use something something uh that's just never crossed my mind it's it's really weird man but that's the way i'm wired i'm picky man i can't help it that's another reason my records 
everything's in tune on my records, man, because I can't take anything out of tune. When I made the move to production, I had to say, man, look, I know my guitar playing is going to suffer because I won't be playing 12 hours a day anymore. But I wanted to make royalties and I have too many ideas of writing to not use them. And my arranging ability, you know, I've always been, I mean, I'm music's my life. Yeah. You know? And we got to give David Foster a lot of credit on these records, man, because David would come up with parts on the spot. You know, David's a genius, man. It's not all me, believe me. David and I wrote the song Morning for an instrumental album he did for Japan. Yeah. And yeah. it started with a guitar part. I came up with the guitar part and then we were off to the races, right? So when I write the charts out, I write the charts out. Yeah. There's a lot of notes on here. With all the counter melodies in it. Yep. Wow, man. This is a lot of work. A lot of work, yeah. And But the, the, the Jerry Hay arrangements, he did himself, or? Yeah, the, the Jerry Hay arrangements, Um, there's a great story about that. Now, see, oh, by the way, David and I had already played the tune for his yeah. record. So on the piano part, which is the upper stave, I'd written out stuff he had played that he may have forgotten. Oh. And I just wrote it out for him to use or not use. And I wrote the guitar play part out so I wouldn't forget. Um, by the way, man, Jeff McCarl was an artist. Yeah. An artist. He wrote this on the back of my chart. Oh man. It's incredible. With that in mind, when you hit a snare drum, which way is the air moving? Oh, <laughs> that's a question. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah, the, the way to, to the mic? Yeah, here we have a snare drum. Yeah. And okay, the drummer's here and I typically mic you know on the far side um not directly the toms are in the way typically but if the if the snare's here the snare top's here you know i'm micing like here on the other side at about a 45 degree angle and about that far from the snare in about an inch okay so when the snare is being hit which way is the air moving down yes which means what What does that mean physics-wise and phase-wise? The air's going down. Yeah. Microphone hears the air going down okay. before it comes up. So it's inverted phase inverted or inverted phase. Air. Okay? Yes. You get this? Yes, I get it. Okay. When a lot of people mic the top and the bottom snare, they usually flip the phase on the bottom of the snare because they don't know what I know. That's wrong. Why is it wrong? Which way is the air coming off the bottom head of the snare? At attack. You attack it, which way is the air moving on the bottom snare head? Wow, man. Uh, up? Away. Away. Away from the head, down. So that mic would be seeing correct phase, but everybody inverts that one, not knowing why. So you're getting an inverted phase on both drums at attack. It's not good. This takes the whole set into play. There's only one drum that sees proper phase. What is it? <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> the kick drum? I do a lot of thinking about this yeah, stuff. Yeah, the kick drum? You're correct. So that's the only one that doesn't yeah. get flipped. Okay? Now, I'm just touching on this. Where this goes is going to blow your mind. When, when I show you what's actually happening and the way to fix phase to get the best possible drum sound, you're going to love it. <laughs> 
No, man, it's a simple technique. It's it's common stuff. When I was a studio musician full time, working around the clock, I saw how every engineer mic'd and EQ'd drums. I noticed the mics they use. I noticed the EQs, basic settings, and I paid attention. And it was a great learning experience, man. You know, from the real good engineers. So I had a good idea of what was happening going in. But okay, for the toms, here we got a tom. Okay. Yeah. Tip, it's the same thing. At the farthest point away from where the drummer is, I angle it down on about a 45 degree angle, just like the snare, and I go in about an inch or two. The farther in I get, the more stick attack is going to be heard. There's a balance between the, but also there's more low end. So there's a, a fine balance between, um, the mic position and i'll just play around with it until i get it right you know i'll go back in the control room listen and then okay i'm listening to the drummer hitting it and okay now move it just forward a little bit okay this isn't working let's try another spot we'll move over a couple inches so that way you can really nail it but i never got that picky but i would now yeah for the kick drum the key is when you get a mic inside the kick I, I was usually about a foot back and about halfway between where the beater hits and the left shell with me looking at it, right? That was the typical spot. But once again, when I do this with the second engineer, I'm just going to have him keep moving it and keep moving it till I find the really the best spot, okay? So now, and I can't remember what the name of the mic was, 421, something, Sennheiser 421, think i used a lot um anyway now also we know engineers mic outside the drum that you know the outside head right yeah okay major phase problem because we've got a distance between the sound traveling to each mic so when now that we've got pro tools it's easy to line the stuff up if the kick drum is being hit, I never used an outside mic because I knew of the phase problems and I there wasn't a way to fix it easily. There is a way now I could have done it with analog, but it's a long story. Anyway, so um, now with the mic outside the drum, after the first, you know, after I'm not even monitoring that mic, I get it to sound good and then I just un I mute it on the monitor. It's recording on its own track, but I mute it so I'm not hearing it while he's playing because it'll make a phase problem and cancel out a lot of different frequencies. It's too close. It causes a comb filter effect where you got frequencies looking like this if it was graphed out. So I don't monitor the outside mic, and after recording, then I, sh I slide the outside mic to match the exact peak of the inside mic, peak to peak. Yeah. Wherever the peak is on the kick with the close mic, I slide the audio, the whole track, in reverse to match that peak. That way it's going to be in perfect phase, and it's going to give you the biggest sound possible. The reason it's called comb filtering is it looks like the teeth on a comb. Yeah. yeah. This when you're in it before you actually hear a delay, like before you hear like if you had a delay line or something, you know, and you want like a da da sound, that's about sixty milliseconds of delay. But when you're in this area of like 10, 12, 15 milliseconds, you're not gonna actually hear a delay. You're just gonna get a comb filtering effect. Yeah. It's ugly. Uh, EMT plate. Okay. On the albums, bef the album right after Breaking Away was the first one recorded in this studio. And in my old home studio, I couldn't record tracks because I didn't have a big enough room for tracks. And you know, it was a bedroom and a garage, and the garage was treated to you know be dead and um and double walled so we wouldn't get any traffic noise i had a uh, akg bx20 and an akg bx10 the 20 was a lot better than the 10. i still have them but I, then i never turn them on that was my reverb on everything those two reverbs were my reverbs for everything when i mixed until after the breaking away album um i have two plates um, I haven't been using them in the last 
15 years because they're a little noisy and i've got there's so many great electronic reverbs now yeah you know lexicons i got a 480 and you know all kinds of stuff um but no that was the bx20 and it was a spring unit man i and i had to eq it to death to make it sound good yeah because it really didn't sound good you know so i had to do my best to, to get it sounding good <laughs> And here's another story. Lee Scalar was a kid prodigy concert pianist, but he hated it. So when he switched to bass, he, the, that was it for the piano. And the reason I know this is because I was on a Gene Page date with him, and Gene wrote all the parts out. Those were difficult parts. Yeah. Really, really difficult. I had to play the piano part a lot of times on guitar. I'd adapt it to guitar, but it wasn't, that was always challenging. And um, the bass part was always written out. And there was this one tune, it was Leon bass. It was one tune, man, that was like really difficult. I, I'm looking at the bass part on the page. And I went up to Scalar and I said, hey, man, well, how did you learn to read? What's the deal? He says, I was a contra pianist. And he told me the story. I said, well, no wonder you're such a great reader. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I just was watching you on YouTube the video that you played, my, one of my favorite songs of yours, uh, Nothing You Can Do About It, live in uh, with Chester Thompson and with Lee Sklar, David Foster's figure, you singing it. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, in Japan in 1905 yeah. or six. Amazing. Yeah, the Super Producers Tour. <laughs> Is there one thought in your mind that you say, man, I'm going to put up all the old gear and I'm going to record a song like I did in the old days? <laughs> well, I have all the old gear. You can yeah. see there's there's a, there's two 24 tracks behind me. One of them is in the picture, the one on this side. Yeah. The other one isn't. But I'm afraid to turn these things on, man. My two tracks, uh, the rubber worn off the capstan and i'd have to go through so much to get these machines working again and so the, a lot of the parts aren't available i thought about doing this but nobody's gonna care nobody's gonna care man i'm gonna care well you're gonna care yeah. there's one yeah <laughs> man, that would be my, my my for me it's really strange maybe because i grew up with, with this sound I'm, I'm only the sound of nowadays is not my thing it's really i'm every music we make we want to sound like you did in the in the in the 80s like that that's now the hip hipness of nowadays is that everybody's trying to make their record sounds like uh, the 80s you know so well, the, the way i put this is we were the last golden era of music we got away with murder like you know Let's take it from the beginning. Okay, so jazz recording started in 1878 or 77 on the Edison cil cylinder disc. They didn't have a way to copy those, so they had to record the song over and over and over and over and over. Okay, then came the megaphone recording days, and they could get maybe a hundred pressings off one master, so they had to keep recording, 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 recording. When did tapes show up in the 50s? something like that there was no way to overdub and punch in until we got to tape and then les paul finally figured out how to uh, design cell sync so we could punch in so the only difference that we had between the original recording and when tape machines came in was the fact we could punch in and fix things okay yeah so we had to be really good nobody wanted you know i mean i rarely ever had to punch in a part when i'm on a record date if it's solos that's different but okay now we get to pro tools now anybody can be made to sound good right so it's just uh, it's not natural anymore nobody really goes through the natural process of recording and the musicianship doesn't have to be that good well and it, it's just sad, man. That the craftsmanship of, of the drummers, especially because, well, it's for every instrument very hard, but the drummer have such a responsibility in a track, but they played it from the start at the end in one or two or three takes, and that's it. No editing, nothing, no oh, quantizing. 
three takes, four takes maximum. Usually by the second take, we've got it nailed. You know, we run it down. We work out any problems there are in the charts. We make a take. We listen. And usually the take after that is the one. At third take sometimes, some guys would run it into the ground and we'd do 50 takes. You know, whatever, man. It was our job to just do what we're told. Did the bass and, and the foundation play with each other in the room? Or was it always only drums starting? No, it was always a rhythm section. Always a rhythm section. Always. Well, there were some guys that did it, disco guys. I remember a couple of disco guys I worked for. After we rehearsed the tune, then the drummer would play. Then the bass player would play. Then the keyboard player or me would play. And that's an okay way to build it. That's fun. Everybody already knew the song. That's better than adding drums at the end. Yeah. Um, the, but the idea here is, man, to start, okay, peg. It was recorded, I think, 10 different rhythm sections. You know, I played the solo on that song, yeah. right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's like the seventh cat. And you talk about picky. Donald and Walter were picky. Yeah. But I didn't find that. I'm picky. Okay. So they cut the track with like 10 different drummers or different configurations. Then finally, Rick Murata shows up with that great feeling hat, right? That just feels outstanding. And they wiped everything but the drums and started it over they finally got a drum trap drum track they loved then they added uh, chuck graining on bass and chuck had played the track before they may have guide chords but you know probably low in the mix just had chuck play with the with the drums you know been barely hearing the melodic off in the background then they probably added keyboard and then probably steve Kahn on the guitar part but you know man that's the way to really if you're going to put drums on first that's the way to put yeah but but also it's nice to have have the the, the rhythm section playing at one time but then you know fagan and, and becker are so particular a lot of times they're going to want to uh, get rid of parts and fix it and so would i yeah. i've done but you know if, if you really do if it's a great band if the rhythm section's top studio cats you know that's how i recorded for my productions i didn't record the drums at first or any of that you know i did just just hire the best cats for the song and i'm gonna get takes that i love quickly okay i'm doing an autobiography that's what i have to do next after i mix jar i'm gonna video myself doing an autobiography there's there'll be some funny stories you know um they'll be it, it'll it should be fun and um a lot of inside stories and weird stuff too that happen on sessions and all that kind of stuff then i'm doing this book with stefan and peppy olsen i told you about that's the chord dictionary a thousand rhythm guitar parts and a lot more so the order is going to be autobiography youtube uh jar album first jar album jar two the album is going to be called code um then and that's me and randy goodrum by the way and you can available it'll be available through my stuff and the old al album's available through my site uh okay so jar autobiography youtube channel then the guitar and keyboard and drum book wow. so that's the order oh the dx7, the DX7. library somewhere in there and for anybody that doesn't have fender e the f famous e electric piano if you're a keyboard player you want this man yeah there's no roads ever there is not a better roads ever okay period wow you don't have to look around man and it's just piece of cake man because you can play on any keyboard you want oh it's great <laughs> You know, David Foster and I were like inseparable for about 20 years, and we're still great friends, of course. And um, David was on a record date. It was his record date. And he called me up and he said, I just played the most incredible sounding roads I've ever heard. Yeah. And I said, well, how do I identify it? I said, you know, we're recording a bunch of our tunes in about a week. 
for the Jero album, the album entitled Jero. And I said, how do I identify it? He says, well, Leeds has it. He rents it. And that was a big rental place back then. And it's an E stenciled on it. He didn't number the roads. He used letters. So that would have been the fifth roads he had bought. But before I get to how much it blew my mind when we were working with it, Andy Leeds was in a music store called Wallach's Music City on Sunset and Vine. And that was the major music store, um, probably starting in the 40s when they played. They had booths where you could audition records and they sold all kinds of musical gear later on. And this was in about 19... 81 or two and Leeds went in the back room with the salesman and said man what's all the stuff piled up in here why aren't why don't you have this on the main floor and the guy said well you know obviously um, the stock is not being dealt with properly and so there's these giant piles to the ceiling of all kinds of stuff and Leeds says what's that big box on the bottom of this one pile so they took everything off and they opened it up and that ended up being the e it had sat in the box for nine years brand new wow. <laughs> wow man so i booked the roads for the Jero session and while i'm in this very room eqing the roads I hit the talk back in about 30 seconds and I said, David, you are right. This road is completely even. There's no clanks, you know, no uneven notes. There's no ugly mid range. It's just big and beautiful and sweet. And he says, yeah, man. Well, I told everybody and I always booked it for my sessions. I told all my keyboard player buddies and the word got out and as each cat rented the roads guys like robbie buchanan guys like omardian greg matheson one of my best friends yeah. and the other cats it became so difficult to book i'd have to book the roads two months in advance to get it then i'd book the musicians that's how popular it got okay. I can understand, man. Oh, yeah, man. And then George Mamalakis, who I met probably in the 90s, I'd wondered what happened to the roads because Leeds sold his business. Yeah. And I just hunted around, you know, and did some searching. And I found out George Mamalakis, a guy that lives in a town about an hour and a half from here called Santa Barbara. He's a really good piano player and he'd bought it. And we became friends and I said, George, whenever memory gets cheap enough, we've got to sample this. Yeah. So I gave him about a hundred pages of instructions because I couldn't be at his house when this work was being done. Um, the first thing we did that a lot of people don't understand about vintage gear is vintage gear. When you buy something that's vintage, that's a 15 years or older, the very first thing you do with an electronic instrument is replace all the capacitors. They've dried out. They're going to sound tired. It's just not smart to just leave the instrument as it is. No. You know, some people are on this trip that, oh, it's vintage, man. I'm not going to touch it. Wrong. So what I did is I told George to write out, I told him to get a piece of cardboard about five feet wide by about four feet. And I said, get the schematic out and write down where every component is. And as we take out old capacitors and other parts, tape them, scotch tape them onto this giant piece of cardboard in case the sound changes where we don't like it. So he did that. But ironically, well, not, but logically, we didn't, all those stuff we replaced with, it all, it just kept sounding better and better and better. Then we bypassed some electronics that weren't needed and it even got bigger sounding. And, you know, we got the rose in pristine shape and we also added some really cool stuff. We've got a true stereo mode. So if you use an acoustic piano sample with the E sample, the, the, the notes will pan with a real acoustic piano. It's not just a giant mono chorus. Yeah. Amazing. Well, we can order that. That's uh, you can order it as a plugin or. Uh... Yes, it runs in Contact or Contact Player. 
make sure to go to the presets and go to my first patch under my name that's the one that really sounds like it did in the old days yeah man you can either get it through my website there's a link or you can go to orange tree samples.com so the link is here below <laughs> the link yeah good good put it on there the link, link would be here below yeah you see the link now yes <laughs> Greg Schlepfer, the guy that owns Orange Tree Samples, and another very good friend of mine who introduced me to Greg, out of nowhere, he decided that he wanted to do an, a DX library, DX7 library, oh. with Greg. And I said, wait a minute, man, you want me involved for a lot of reasons. So I'm involved. There's going to be patches in here that are going to blow you away. Oh, man. Plus, we're going beyond... the. I don't know how many thousands of patches we're going to have, but these are from the best programmers. Anyway, besides that, we're going to sample uh, the GS1, I think it was called, a very rare Yamaha synth, and a couple of more. And those instruments have um, Steve Picaro, who's a real good friend of mine, who was in Toto for many years. The sound for human nature yeah. is one of the patches. And the sound and a bunch of Toto songs were on this G, GS1 or whatever it was called. It was a four operator version of the DX7, which is six operators. So we're getting all these patches together and this is going to be big. <laughs> The only synth I have here is uh, is the Yamaha DX7. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I used for years. Yeah, I know. I try to s make my production sounds like your productions. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, check this out. You know that the when the battery dies, when the memory battery dies, all the sounds go. Yeah. Well, I have three of them and a TX816, right? Okay. My main one, the battery's dead, but all the other sounds were in the second one. Yeah. And, and the third one has a bunch of bass sounds, and the TX-816 uh, rack has tons of great stuff that I got from different cats. And, um, yeah, so I, I retrieved everything, so we, we've got that straight. But check this out, man. You might not know this. The DX7 only went from MIDI velocity 17 through 100. It didn't go from 1 to 127, but the TXs go to 127. Okay. Oh, when you play a DX7 patch in the TX, it's going to get a lot brighter when it wasn't meant to be brighter. So anybody with a DX... Um, that has uh, the, the 816s or a newer DX. Well, there's not any, I don't know if the DX ever went to 127. In any case, if you're using an 816 and you're using uh, the DX7 as a controller, no problem, because it only puts out up to 100 on MIDI. Wow. So, parts of velocity. But that's just a little tip for yeah. you, Kathy. I have a expander card version. I forget what it's called, but there's like nine banks of 32 sounds. Ooh. And I didn't realize this, and it took me a week to figure out how to get system exclusive on because nobody supports this. They don't make them anymore, obviously, because what's the point? So I had to, man, a bunch of us were hunting online, and, and um, Stefan found the manual that I needed for this e-card to get all of the banks out of there to give to Greg. So we got that done. Thank you for all the stories and for your time, of course. My pleasure. Uh